got a story for you. One year at Christmas time, um, I'm going to guess I was 12 years old at this point. We were at my grandparents' house, and the we in this story being my dad, my stepmom, my two brothers, and my two stepbrothers. Now, this was our annual Christmas Eve dinner over on the Martin side, and so the whole family was there, including all eight of my cousins. And eventually it came time for the kids to go down to the basement while the aunts and the uncles and the grandparents filled the stockings up above. Now, this particular year, we'd somehow managed to bring our Nintendo with us. And so instead of watching the Christmas story on my grandpa's old 19-inch Magnavox, as was our tradition every year, my brothers and I hooked up our beloved gaming system and let all our cousins take turns squashing Goombas and chasing magical mushrooms. At one point, one of the youngest cousins, they were probably six years old and almost certainly had never touched a video game in their life, uh, they were handed the controller and they were invited to maneuver a little Mario around the screen. Of course, they were horrible at it, jumping off cliffs, running into the little shop of horrors plants that rise up out of the sewers and generally making a mess of things. But they were delighted nonetheless, as were the rest of us cousins enjoying their joy, and laughing at the silliness of it all. Whether or not they were successful at raising the flagpole at the end of the level was truly of zero significance. Except there was one person among us not amused by my younger cousin's ineptitude. <laughs> and that was my slightly older-than-me stepbrother. I remember him sitting next to me completely baffled at why everyone else found this whole thing amusing. He was annoyed that my cousin kept dying, and our laughter at the whole situation just seemed to make things worse for him. I remember him shouting at my cousin to do this and stop doing that, totally frustrated by the entire situation. I finally turned to him and said, bro, relax. They're just a little kid doing their best. Give them some credit. Credit, he asked, further incredulized by the whole thing. Credit for what? At that point, he stormed out of the room, furious that no one seemed to care how bad our little cousin was at Super Mario Brothers. Now, that story has stuck with me for years. I think maybe for two reasons. First, I remember being thoroughly confused why my stepbrother was so thrown off by something as benign as a six-year-old kid's inability to navigate the complex world of a video game system that they've surely never encountered before. Of course, times have changed now, haven't they? Uh, most six-year-olds today can do circles around us when it comes to such things. But I remember back in my grandparents' basement, this overwhelming sense of, well, of course little so-and-so, my cousin, wouldn't be good at this game. But that's not really the point, is it? Yet against the seeming universal agreement of an acceptance by the majority of the rest of us Martin kids, there stood this stark contrast of my stepbrother's lone voice irritated at the situation and vexed by why we all seemed fine with it. And maybe the second reason I remember this, otherwise not all that memorable moment, is because it was a few years later that our family then had language to help us better understand my stepbrother. It turns out he has Asperger's syndrome, a neurodevelopmental, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder in which things like social interaction can be extremely difficult and extending empathy like understanding why a small child would not do well at a video game, is almost impossible, especially at 12 years old. So when I think back to my that moment in the basement where my cousin, in the eyes of my stepbrother, was doing everything, quote, wrong, I can see how, oh, of course he would have struggled with that situation. Because my stepbrother in his mind knew so clearly what needed to be done to properly execute the runnings and the jumping of that little Italian plumber. And all the while, unable to appreciate that such maneuvers would be all but impossible for the novice mind and the tiny hands of a little kid. This response that my stepbrother gave of credit? Credit for what? At the time seemed cold and uncaring and unwilling to take all the factors into consideration. As though we had no space for someone's inadequacies 
to be acceptable. In his mind, as he saw the world, whatever reasons they might have had contributing to their struggle, they were irrelevant. The only logical conclusion was, but you're doing it wrong, so no credit here shall be given. Jesus once told a parable about an owner of a vineyard who hired some guys early in the morning to work the field, offering them a full day's wages for their time. Makes sense. But then as the day wore on, the vintner went out at different times throughout the day and procured more laborers to come and work. And you can imagine that as different workers showed up, they heard what the first laborers were getting paid. They did the hourly math and worked out what they could expect to be paid. Clearly, it would be less pay, though, because they worked less hours. And for the final push of the day, the landowner snagged just a few more workers right as the sun was nearly down. And when at last the day's work ended, everyone lined up to get paid, and the owner gave his manager instructions to pay the laborers. And he said, start with the ones that we just hired last and give them a full day's wages. Whoa, what? (laughs) The manager had to be confused. A full day's wages for just an hour worked? And did that mean that now that, that that was the going rate and so workers who were there for longer would receive double or triple or even quadruple that amount? No, the boss said, everyone gets the same. And as you might expect, this infuriated the workers who'd been there all day as it pushed up against their very sense of they had about fairness and equality. So they started grumbling against the landowner, furious that they toiled all day in the hot sun, but received the same pay as those who had only just arrived. And Jesus ends the story by saying that the landowner walks over to the group of complainers and says, hey, pal, what's the problem here? I asked you this morning if you wanted to work today. I offered you a day's wages and you said yes. And I've honored our arrangement. Now you're going to come back and gripe at me? No, I don't think so. You can take your money and your ungrateful attitude. Get out of here. Don't resent me because I'm feeling generous today and I want to give away a day's wages to everyone. It's my money. Now scram. For Jesus, this little feel-good story (laughs) illustrates what life is like in what he called the kingdom of God. Or we might say how life can be experienced when we are locked into the full flow of God's love and presence. When the heart and the will and the dreams of God are made manifest on earth as they are in heaven. Now, why did Jesus tell this particular story to illustrate this unique aspect of the kingdom? Because just moments before, there was this interaction where Jesus expressed this, uh, this sadness, this sorrow. He lamented when a person of great riches was unable to unburden themselves from their vast wealth so that they might better know the love of God firsthand. It's easier for a camel, Jesus said, to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enjoy God's kingdom. And when he said this, his disciples were stunned because in their worldview at that time, they believed that if you were wealthy, it was precisely because you were blessed by God. Well, who then can be liberated? Who can be saved? They asked. Translation, if that guy isn't deserving... If he's not good enough, then who the heck is? It would be like a model agency interviewing Tyra Banks and saying, meh, next. Or a recording artist asking Jay-Z to lay down some tracks for him, and then upon hearing it saying, eh, next. Or a publishing house receiving a manuscript about a wizard boy who survived the killing of his parents by an evil sorcerer with nothing but a lightning scar above his eye to show for it and replying back, meh, next. Okay, the last one actually happened 12 times as it were. But that's the dynamic at play here when Jesus expresses sorrow that this man of many means will be unable to enter the kingdom of God while still being attached to all of his material possessions to which the disciples rationally responded, if you're saying he's not worthy, 
then what hope do the rest of us have? Worthy? Worthy. Who said anything about being worthy? The kingdom of God is not about worth. Not about earning your way in or proving that you belong. It's about grace. It's about the free flowing, unending reality of love that just is. Irrespective of our efforts to deserve it or resist it or ignore it. But this sort of grace it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for most of us. Or as Jesus put it, yeah, for human beings, this is kind of impossible. But all things are possible for God. Peter, in this moment, thinks he's picking up a bit of what Jesus is putting down about this whole rich man and the camel and the eye of the needle thing. And he says, hey, so uh, check it out. Um, we've, we've left everything and followed you. Um, so what do we get? Did we do it right, Lord? Are we, are, are we worthy? And then it was at that point that Jesus told the aforementioned parable about the workers in the vineyard who all worked varying degrees of hours and yet all became recipients of the same dose of the owner's generosity, which as pointed out a minute ago, does not feel like generosity to those who believed that not only did they deserve what they got, but they deserved even more than others. In his reflection on this parable, Episcopal priest Robert Farrar Capone points out that while this parable is about grace, yes, the grace of the landowner who distributes his gifts regardless of merit, it's also about a type of judgment. The judgment upon those workers who grumbled at grace, upon those who object to the indiscriminate liberality by which the owner gave away his money. For they, the grumblers in the story, had their sights set on this matter of worthiness. They were expert bookkeepers, if you were, tallying who deserved what and why. But bookkeeping, Capone writes, is the only punishable offense in the kingdom of heaven. I just love that line. Bookkeeping is the only punishable offense in the kingdom of heaven. And then he writes, if the world could have been saved by bookkeeping, it would have been saved by Moses, not Jesus. Now think about that for a second. We had a thousand years, give or take, under the law of Moses to see if such an arrangement could work. If it could do enough to earn love, to earn acceptance. And the final verdict, according to Jesus at least, was no. No one actually can pass that test. Or as St. Paul once wrote, no one is righteous, not even one. Now, I suppose it's possible, sure, that God gave humans the law knowing that it ultimately was a doomed system. Uh, but I also tend to think that maybe God just kind of permitted us to go in that direction, knowing that we had to figure it out for ourselves, figure out that when it comes to this idea of worthiness, that we are all SOL, <laughs> We all, as Francis Spufford writes, carry the HPTFTU, otherwise known as the human propensity to F things up. With humans, this is impossible, but not with God. Now, many of us, myself included, we grew up in a type of Christianity hyper-focused on how unworthy we are. We took this seed of truth that we all have HPTFTU, and we extracted from that this insistence that we are inherently broken, worthy only of eternal doom. And so we were shamed for this simple fact that we are imperfect humans doing the best we can. I feel like to be human is kind of to be like a six-year-old trying to play Super Mario Brothers for the first time and failing for all sorts of obvious reasons all the while being shamed by religion for our shortcomings. Credit? What credit? Why should we give you any credit, 
say our priests and holy books. But even religion in this metaphor that I'm bending to the point of breaking, even religion, like my stepbrother, is, you could say, hindered by factors that alter how they see the world. For religion is and always has been in the bookkeeping business, assuming that there are gods to whom we must appease, gods whose love and acceptance we must bargain for, earn, be worthy of. And even though Jesus did all he could to expose the lie of those beliefs, indeed, even giving up his own life to prove it, the religion built around his name lost sight of his central teachings and became instead yet one more system of here's what you must do to become acceptable, to be loved, and to belong. Now, here at Sojourn over the years, we've We've done a lot of work and tried really hard to counter that narrative. You are not broken. You are not damaged. You are not inherently unlovable to God. And in my earnest desire to undo these damaging narratives, I've often kind of, I guess, swung the pendulum the other way, boldly declaring, you are worthy. (laughs) You are worthy of love and acceptance and grace and belonging. Yes, yes. But can I confess something to you? There have been countless times over the years that I've struggled saying that sentence, or, or, or I guess more accurately, struggled finishing that sentence. I'd say something like, you are worthy, and then end it with, like, because you have breath in your lungs, <laughs> or you are worthy because you're alive and you're human, And even though the intent was good, which is to counter the story of you being worthless and unworthy, I've nonetheless not always felt great about my various antidotes, about insisting that we are worthy because of this or because of that. And it hit me this week, maybe it's because I'm still playing the worthy game. I'm still participating in the bookkeeping business. It's just that I've decided that everyone is worthy. Everyone deserves it. We all deserve it. I've gone from Thor telling the other Avengers who couldn't lift his hammer that you are not worthy. No one is worthy. I've gone then to Oprah saying, you are worthy and you are worthy. Everyone's worthy. Which is, yes, still better. (laughs) But maybe also still misses the point. And then here's the key, this week that unlocked, or I should say is unlocking, let's be honest, is unlocking, present tense, still happening, this for me. I was reading Thomas Merton's New Seeds of Contemplation this week, and I came across this paragraph while Thomas was reflecting about how we will always struggle to love other people if we have not first come to see that we ourselves are loved and worthy to be loved. He, he writes this, in the true Christian vision of God's love, And if some of those words trip you up, just maybe imagine it saying, in the true idea of love, the idea of worthiness loses its significance. Revelation of the mercy of God makes the whole problem of worthiness something almost laughable. Since no one could ever by themselves be strictly worthy to be loved with such a love, the discovery that worthiness is of no special consequence, it really is a true liberation of the Spirit. When we are delivered by the mercy of God, this question of worthiness no longer has meaning. All right, friends, lean in a little bit closer. If, I've, if your attention has drifted a bit, I don't blame you. Sorry, this has gone on a little longer than normal. But see if you can come back here with me just, just for a moment. Last few minutes here together. What if the answer to the problematic beliefs that you are not worthy is not, as I've believed and talked about for years, to shout even louder, yes, you are worthy. Rather, what if it's to disagree with the question altogether. That worthiness 
has nothing to do with it. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. In other words, we're all arriving at the same time because none of us are more or less worthy than another. That isn't even the point. And as Merton says, this truth, when fully taken in, it leads to a true liberation of the spirit. Oh, the freedom, the freedom when we can stop trying to earn our worthiness. Because I got to tell you that even when I've taken this approach of you are worthy simply by virtue of being human, when I've applied that to myself, guys, I still end up trying to justify it. I still try to live up to it. I try to show who, myself, God, others, I don't know, that I am indeed worthy. Which means, like Peter, I'm still kind of missing the point. I mean, parents, who among us considers our child and says, they are not worthy of my love? No one, of course. And yet, neither do we really think in terms of they are worthy of my love or they do deserve my love. We just don't really think about worthiness at all. We just love our child, regardless of anything like worth. The prophet Isaiah had this message from God for the people of Israel, and it went like this. Don't fear. Don't fear, for I have rescued you. I've called you by name. You are mine. I will be with you. The rivers won't sweep you away. The flames of the fire will not burn you because you are precious in my eyes. You are honored and I love you. Now, maybe if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you might be wondering, how is this connected to soul care practices, <laughs> the series that we're in? Well, here's what I think. I think that believing that we are unworthy of love is a death to the soul. And I kind of think that believing we are worthy of this sort of love can also be a sickness to the soul. Because then maybe we might stop seeing those parts of us that can cause harm to ourselves and others. Or we might keep hustling to prove our worth and miss the point of grace altogether. So instead, I wonder... Maybe our practice this week can be a practice of belief, which can be hard, I'll grant you, especially because many of us have had the muscle of belief atrophy over years um, of, of misuse or unuse, or we have rightly locked it away because it's a painful reminder of past wounds. Yet might it not be one of the sole features that separates us from other creatures? Our ability to, quote, believe in things that we cannot confirm with our primitive senses? Indeed, is not our very soul dependent upon a belief that it even exists, let alone how we might then care for it? So my invitation for us is this, that our practice this week is to believe, specifically believe that we are loved. Again, from Merton, the root of Christian love is the faith that one is Loved, the faith that one is loved by God. The faith that one is loved by God, although unworthy or rather irrespective of one's worth. For a culture and a world obsessed with bookkeeping, I acknowledge that this way of thinking is not easy. The risk is real of walking back sentiments like, you are worthy of such love. The risk is real in that we might then think we are not worthy of love. But the challenge is to consider that when it comes to being loved by God, when it comes to your true identity as a loved child of God, worthiness has nothing to do with it. And if that's not the greatest message about love on a Valentine's Day, I love you, just because I want to, then I don't know what is. I'll close by sharing this quote from Rachel Cargill that Kate sent me this week when she heard what I was going to talk about. Uh, Rachel says this, questioning your worth is, it's like asking yourself if you deserve the sun to shine. There's nothing about you that determines its presence. 
You could stand indoors and deny it's even there. Or, or you can bask in it and let it warm you. May we bask in the warmth of God's love today, this week, and always. Amen.